All right, um, welcome along everybody. My name is Clint Greaves from Real Estate Investor and um, we're very lucky to have Dr. Andrew Wilson, the Chief Economist from Domain Group, joining us tonight to, uh, to do an Australian-wide um, and in particular Capital Cities market update um, as, of, uh, as of right now. So uh, Dr. Wilson's got uh, a lot of interesting insights in terms of what's been happening in the market and also some of the key trends uh, and, and therefore, you know, things to look out for and opportunities uh, that we should all be thinking about as part of what's happening right across the country and in some of the specific markets right across the country. So uh, we've got a lot of content that uh, we're going to cover off this evening. And, and I want to say thanks very much to Sh Terry Shear, uh, Australia's leading landlord insurance specialist, who have uh, enabled the session tonight to happen. So uh, tonight's session has been has been facilitated and and arranged thanks to um, the good people there at Terry Share. So thank you very much for that, guys. Okay, so in terms of um, the session this evening, uh, just in terms of uh, a little bit of housekeeping, in terms of making sure that you get the best experience this evening, uh, please just make sure your speakers are on and your volume is up and that you're not on mute uh, and all of those sorts of things. And, and if you can hear me, um, then obviously um, you're all set to go. If you can't, then... Um, the fact that you're reading this will hopefully assist you with that. If you do have any issues uh, throughout the session, um, you can test your audio uh, in the control panel area, which is the small dashboard, which is probably um, either somewhere towards the top right of your screen or, or at the bottom of your screen, depending on the type of device that you're, uh, that you're joining on uh, this evening. Um, in terms of getting the best quality uh, feed, uh, internet speed is, is really important uh, and your internet speed is important. So if you turn off other uh, applications that you have on your device, things like uh, your email or Skype or online backups in particular, um, basically the faster the internet, the better the, the, the audio quality that you'll receive. Okay, so uh, we're going to go through a bunch of stuff this evening. Obviously, uh, all of the information that we provide is general information, talking about uh, the market in general. And uh, whilst we'll have a Q&A session and, and we'll encourage everyone on the uh, webinar this evening to, to ask uh, any and all questions that you may have, obviously uh, all of the information that we give is general. Uh, so any information uh, that you receive, you should consider taking uh, you know, the necessary uh, advice uh, from a financial advisor or accountant before making any financial decisions relating to that. Uh, and certainly going to be lots and lots of, of great info that you'll get from this evening's session, I'm sure. Uh, so just, just by way of background, uh, my name is Clint Greaves, as I mentioned, I'm the MD and CEO of Real Estate Investor. Uh, you presumably are, are a member of Real Estate Investor and we have around 250,000 members right across Australia that utilise all our services. Uh, in terms of my background, I, I'm as well as running Investor, I'm a Real Estate Investor, I'm obviously an investor myself as well. I've been investing in residential property for nearly 17 years now. Uh, I've, I've done a number of buy and holds, also things like renovations and a few developments and so on. Um, Real Estate Investor, if you're not that familiar with us, uh, we're a property investing focused tech company. We've been around for a little over, or uh, well, coming up 11 years now. As I mentioned, we've got 250,000 uh, investors who subscribe for the various free uh, membership tools, reports, blogs, information calculators that we provide. Uh, and, and the sorts of things that we're running this evening in conjunction with Dr. Wilson from Domain and, uh, and Terry Share. So uh, Real Estate Invest is all about simplifying the investment process, trying to reduce um, your risks, save time, and, and really help you to create wealth through property investment. And we do that through pulling together a lot of resources that we've created ourselves, but also through partnership, partnerships with industry leaders like Domain, like APM Price Finder, uh, people like Zero from a, from an accounting perspective, eChoice from a finance perspective, Washington and Brown from a, a quantity surveying and depreciation perspective, and, and other partners like Your Investment Property. So it's really about bringing all of those experts together to to provide a, a really deep and rich set of tools and resources to help you, whether you are an existing property investor or someone who's just getting started and that's interested in starting to invest in in, in property and to build your wealth uh, in, in the property market. And so I, I guess in a nutshell, Real Estate Investor exists to help people like you uh, by providing the best advice, the best guidance, uh, and, and products and services that enable you to create wealth through this whole process of investing in property. So what I want to do is, uh, is jump straight in and introduce you to Dr. Andrew Wilson. 
Uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. Wilson uh, on the webinar tonight, and uh, he's the chief economist from the Domain Group. And um, it's fair to say he's he's an absolute leader in uh, in the property space from a from a research uh, and um, an information perspective. So. Dr. Wilson's got experience that spans uh, senior property and construction research positions within uh, industry, academia, and government. He holds a PhD and master's uh, in research in housing market economics. And uh, as you can see on the screen, he's published uh, research in various academic journals and industry publications covering a wide range of residential property and construction issues. And, and most importantly, I think uh, he, um, he is Domain's chief economist and uh, and is uh, working all day, every day on exactly what's happening right across the country in terms of the market. And uh, so in terms of understanding key trends and some of the underlying drivers of those trends, um, certainly in my opinion, there's nobody better to, to share that information with you this evening. As I mentioned, um, I want to thank Terry Shear for, uh, for facilitating tonight and making it possible um, to, to have Dr. Wilson sharing his insights into the market uh, with, with all, of, um, all of you as part of this uh, Real Estate Investor webinar. Terry Shear, our Australia's uh, leading landlord insurance specialist, um, and they've been protecting Aussies um, or Aussie landlords since 1995. And, and I can say from personal experience, uh, as a property investor, you know, I think landlord insurance is, is an absolute must. I would, I would never think of having an investment property without having landlord's insurance and uh, making sure that you have the right landlord insurance is, is equally important, and that's where working with the best of breed and working with specialists in the landlord insurance space is really, really important. So, um, if you're if you're not already using Terry Share, I, I would very uh, strongly suggest that you um, that you, you look into the services that they provide and how they can help you to to protect what is uh, for for most people, other than their personal home, uh, your your most important and most uh, valuable asset, both in terms of your contents and building insurances, but also those landlord specific insurances relating to things like loss of rental income uh, and all of those other fun things that uh, that, that go with um, investment property ownership. So thanks very much to the team at uh, Terry Share for making this evening possible. Okay, so without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Wilson and I'm going to um, Pass the um, pass the, the keyboard and mouse over to you, um, Andrew, so that um, you can step us through what I have no doubt will be a very uh, interesting and enlightening uh, session in terms of the housing market in Australia and uh, and some of the key drivers and, uh, and and the key activity that's happening right now. And it would help if I uh, unmuted you as well. So apologies for that. I'll just uh, unmute you now. Okay, Dr. Wilson, are you there? I'm here, Clint. Thank you very much for that. I hope you can hear me and everybody else. We certainly can. So over to you. So I've got the mouse, so I'm, dry, I'm in the driver's seat now. It's, it's all you now. Okay, thanks for that, Clint. And look, it is, uh, it's great to be here tonight. And uh, hello, everyone. It's, uh, I guess, my favourite topic. It's not just my livelihood, it's also my passion and has been for... Uh, a number of decades and um, look uh, the thing about the housing market and, and the economy really is that it's it's a movable feast in terms of, uh, of changeability and I guess we're, we're seeing that now with uh, with so many differentials in terms of um, what's happening uh, in the housing market and as, as Clint said uh, my role for Domain and Domain I guess we know looking in the media this year and particularly over the last few weeks is um, uh, a part of the Fairfax Group, of course, and has been courted by a number of uh, equity groups, um, you know, uh, reflecting, I guess, its profitability firstly, but um, the fact that um, we have such strong exposure through Domain and Fairfax to the housing market uh, is re reflects what my job is, and that's to clearly provide uh, robust and uh, resilient insights into what's happening in the housing market, because obviously there are investment decisions that are made uh, on the basis of, I, I guess, um, you know, uh, what's really happening in markets rather than a, a lot of the uh, commentary that we, we, we get regarding uh, current performance and the prospects uh, of the market. Uh, I think this year, from my perspective, has been, I guess, one of the uh, 
the most interesting years in terms of commentary in the marketplace. Uh, in fact, from my perspective, it's been frustrating, um, I guess, the type of uh, particularly negative comments about the, the outlook for our housing markets. And uh, I think that what we will be seeing as the year unfolds will be a, a real change in the dynamic and in the narrative uh, in terms of um, our housing market outcomes. Uh, I, I think there's a number of issues that have almost been treated as um, uh, as truisms in, in terms of uh, our housing market structure and uh, and the likely uh, the likely outcomes of that structure um, that uh, I think will be challenged and are being challenged challenged now. Now um, it's almost every week that we get a, a dynamic that's reinforcing or a new data set that's reinforcing uh, where our, our markets are heading and changing, I guess, um, what uh, is uh, you know, generally accepted as being the nature of our housing markets. Now, um, I will start off uh, with a theme, uh, my presentation is to sort of set the scene for my, um, my view of the market currently. And uh, I think the big picture is that we're certainly going to see growth uh, growth in our housing markets set to moderate generally, uh, but that's not for all capital city markets. Um, I think that, um, as we all know, interest rates are a key to um, our housing market performance. And um, I think that the outlook, the further we get away from interest rate cuts of last year, and of course we had a, a cut in May and then in August, and that generally fired up the markets as it typically does. Uh, and we had a very strong finish to the year in most capital city markets. Uh, but I think the further we get away from those interest rate cuts, the less energy there is in, uh, in house price growth. Um, now, uh, the economy, I guess, as it always is, is unfolding, um, you know, and, and particularly, uh, I believe, unfolding in, in a less than uh, optimistic way uh, recently. And, and I think that uh, even though quite uh, uh, confoundingly for me, there's been a lot of speculation that we would get higher interest rates um, from the Reserve Bank at some stage this year, that we hit the bottom of the cycle. Uh, I've always been of the belief that um, we're going to need more stimulus from the Reserve Bank. I think that's now looking uh, more likely with current data that we've had over the last, um, over the last few weeks. And also given um, some of the uh, policies that were announced in the budget last week, particularly the bank tax. Um, Banks have been increasing interest rates this year, of course. Um, again, confounding me in terms of the action that APRA are taking again to uh, taper investor lending, as they did in 2015. Um, again, these issues with one size fits all ad hoc policies um, tend to reflect larger market dynamics and ignore what's happening in what is very much a disparate uh, market environment that we have at the moment. And, uh, you know, I think that a lot of these policies that, that are one size fits all to cover all housing markets, such as, uh, you know, getting banks to uh, de uh, decrease the volume of investor lending can cause uh, more problems than they solve if there are, in fact, uh, problems to solve. So I think interest rates, of course, going forward are the key um, in terms of how housing markets will perform. I think even if we do get a cut in interest rates from the Reserve Bank, which as I said, and I'll give you the reasons later, are more, uh, I think on the cards, more likely now. Um, I think higher interest rates, both from actions from APRA, the financial regulator, and also actions from the banks to offset the uh, tax that they've now got to pay through, as announced in the federal budget, uh, will mean that it'll have a, basically a neutralising effect on, uh, on housing market activity. But there are some other factors uh, outside interest rates in some markets, I think that will have a strong influence on uh, on market outcomes um, this year. But growth set to moderate for most uh, capitals. We'll see if the slide's working, and uh, we'll go to the next slide. This, sorry, guys. I'm just uh... <laughs> Is it working? No, it's not. Where are you going? How do we I'll, can I'll you do that? You're doing that, right? I can do if you like. All right. 
Well, you can be driving and I'll be talking <laughs> in the passenger seat. Sounds like a perfect marriage. Oh, look, it's, um, uh, this has been something I've done a little tongue in cheek recently with the, my sort of opening slide presentations. And uh, I guess it's a little cheeky and a little ironic in a sense, but um, it does reflect what I'm, you know, my frustrations in terms of just not the, the media narrative that we confront, but also what's now being uh, accepted by our uh, uh, policymakers and regulators in terms of the nature of our housing market. And that's what I was saying, generally alluding to before. So obviously this is a, a quote from a classical novel about a, a particular person in the French Revolution called the Scarlet Pimpernel, right? And uh, he was an elusive uh, character who actually didn't exist. But uh, so I've sort of put that in terms of what our housing market uh, uh, commentariat and, uh, and our, uh, now our policy makers are accepting. And of course, that's that elusive housing market bubble that um, you know, seems to be of great concern um, to, uh, as I said, the media has, has run with this particular um, you know, a scare campaign for a number of years now. And uh, you know, the, the historical facts of our, our markets are that we have remarkably robust and resilient uh, outcomes through our cycles. and. Um, uh, the issue, of course, is that that's fine and it uh, creates headlines. But once we start getting um, policymakers interfering in the market based on some uh, concern over unsustainable prices growth and the possibility of sharp declines and start trying to preempt that, uh, I think that's, as I said before, we cause some trouble. So uh, it is an elusive housing bubble that is sought everywhere. And um, as I said, the reality is that our housing markets are remarkably uh, robust and resilient. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, the, the risks to our housing market clearly are higher interest rates. But even with higher interest rates, we, we tend to see an orderly uh, correction phase uh, as interest rates rise. Now, the prospect of higher interest rates are, are becoming more and more fanciful. Even um, the sort of interest rate rises we'd need to see a decline in demand and, and lower prices. Uh, even the banks, their increases in rates are at the margin, and even though they act to flatten housing market activity, there's certainly no sense of a, of a steep decline. We'll, we'll speak about that uh, in a sec. So the housing bubble, um, it's fake news, it's fake property news. Uh, it has been for decades and it will be into the future. As I said, the only clear um, a pathway uh, for a perceived bubble bursting uh, event would be a very sharp increase in interest rates and we've never had that type of a scenario even throughout uh, periods of very sharp increases in rates and uh, declines in economic activity. So if we sort of go to the next, uh, yeah, so we also have another another uh, a mysterious thing that, uh, a mysterious outcome that's been I guess uh, a very popular topic of conversation and that's unit oversupply. Um, I've never been a, an advocate or a supporter of the notion that, um, you know, that we're, we're heading for some apartment glut in, uh, in our major capital city markets. I think that's becoming very evident now that the unit oversupply uh, concerns are very much misplaced and um, that our markets, uh, where we have had significant growth in apartment development, which of course is Melbourne, uh, Sydney and Brisbane, uh, and now we're now starting to see uh, the reality of, of a continuance of undersupplied markets and I'll talk about that later but um, certainly the, the issue with, with oversupply uh, and we're seeing restrictions on um, foreign investors, foreign developers as well as domestic investors um, and uh, the, these these issues are based on all these policy um, solutions so called are based on a sense of providing uh, of, of uh, offsetting this supposed unit oversupply. Um, and as I said, we're clearly seeing now that the Sydney market uh, is remains undersupplied. Um, we're seeing the Melbourne market also uh, no real sign of an apartment glut there. And there's also some early signs that uh, the Brisbane market, which certainly has had uh, supply move ahead of demand, is also now starting to quickly soak up um, available stock. So um, uh, we'll talk through that uh, shortly. But that's the general theme here is I think we've got to look at the issues that uh, would cause investors and property owners concern in terms of, I guess, the narrative of um, uh, what, what we have uh, in, in, you know, almost accepted 
as the nature of our housing markets, but in fact, um, the reality is they remain remarkably stable uh, and resilient. So, um, and that's the that's the perception of the next slide, which which tells us that Australian capacity housing markets um, are typically uh, have, have synchronised orderly growth and and correction phases. And if I could just sort of add why we we have this robust housing market and this resilient housing market, it is basically because of interest rates. And the differential between the Australian housing market and, and other housing markets, particularly similar economies such as the US, and we always seem to be uh, compared to the US in terms of the prospect of um, our housing bubble bursting, is that we have um, a, a very strong uh, banking sector here. Now, obviously that sector was targeted last week in the budget, um, but um, and, and, you know, I, I guess there are always issues about the level of profits that banks do make, but it's the significance of the market power that banks have that actually provides the boundaries around our housing market that really mean that the, the, um, the prospects of a sharp decline or an, um, an unsustainable increase in prices are, are quite remote because what we see is that the banks, because of their market power, don't have to take risks with their borrowing. And that's why even in the strongest market conditions, banks won't lend more than that, typically that 80-20 uh, LVR, and that they won't allow you to repay more than 25% uh, of your repayments from your, from your income. Uh, and what that does, of course, is it creates a, a, a risk-averse environment for our lending, for investor or owner-occupier lending, which means that, um, you know, in a rising market particularly, um, you know, we can't take the risks with purchasing trying to get uh, advantage into the marketplace by having a higher uh, loan to valuation ratio or repaying a higher proportion of our income with our repayments. Um, and that means uh, the bank won't allow us to take the risks, which keeps you know, a very solid boundary around um, the nature of our housing markets. And hence, we have those orderly growth and correction phases. And the synchronisation means that but basically, over time, all our capital city markets move with the same energy, and that's usually the same direction. Uh, certainly, some markets move ahead of the game and some are sort of are behind the game, and that's because of local demand and supply factors. But it is that interest rate dynamic uh, as set, well, you know, traditionally by the Reserve Bank uh, that keeps our markets together. So we're going to have a quick look, a quick history history lesson. And look, if we'll just look at a model... Uh, this is my model of housing market dynamics. Um, we can just run that model. Um, and there we go. It's just a basic business cycle model. Um, it's uh, derived from those change points, of course, the peaks and the trough. It's not just an ad hoc um, sort of uh, drawing. It's um, something that does reflect typically this uh, cycle for our house prices uh, with those trough and peak points. Of course, um, uh, the important thing is our uh, phases, nominating phases within that particular model. So we have a correction phase and that's where prices start falling below a peak point. If we move below um, our previous trough point, we move into a contraction phase. Um, now that would typically be, I guess, the um, environment which we could describe as a bubble market, um, where we would see that typical bubble shape, as you can see there with the trough phase, uh, lower than the previous trough phase of the cycle. Uh, however, our capital city markets um, typically start to rise with a trough point um, that is higher than the previous trough point. Um, and then once we pass our previous peak point, we then move into a, a recovery phase and, and on the cycle goes. Now, with reference to this uh, model, just a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, the first thing is that um, I think in the future, even though this shape is, is diagrammatical, I think that we're going to see, because of the nature of our low growth, low interest rate, low income economy, that, that even though those peak and trough points will follow the same basic shape with peaks and troughs being higher than the previous phases, I think we're going to see a much flatter uh, journey in terms of the distance between those peak and trough points. And I think that's just the, the fact that um, we are going to see a much uh, more stable outlook for interest rates into the future. This, of course, does reflect what is going to be quite a, a subdued sort of second gear economy that we're, we're in for the longer term, I believe. Um, so in a way, the prospects of not having higher rates, and of course, higher rates would really only come with a strengthening of, of our economy. 
And the latest data is certainly anything but good in terms of the outlook for uh, for the economy. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss that shortly. But uh, I, I believe that um, we're now starting to look at an interest rate cut over the next couple of months. Um, a lot will depend on the unemployment data. And we had some better unemployment data news today. National unemployment rate down to 5.7% and 5.9%. Probably the best bit of economic news we've had all year. Um, but we've certainly got a lot of other very um, concerning economic news which we'll talk about uh, regarding interest rates in the future. So look, that's a model. Just one other thing I wanted to mention, um, and I, I did a, a presentation on Perth yesterday, just a short one. Um, and I was looking at the, the Perth uh, market in terms of this particular model. Now, we all know that because of the end of the uh, resources burn, the Perth market has tracked backwards sharply. And no surprise, it did have a very sharp growth period through that mining boom period of 2012-13. started to decline uh, when the mining boom finished. The fly-in, fly-outs flew out and didn't fly back in again. Um, and we have seen prices declining. Um, and uh, I, I was interested just in terms of the models to see whether that would hold true. In other words, whether the trough point of the, this particular cycle, uh, the correction phase that Perth's in, um, would maintain itself or find a, a levelling off before the previous or higher than the previous trough point. Well, quite interestingly, the data that we've run um, just over the last week shows us that uh, it looks like the Perth, um, the Perth market is now uh, finding a consistent bottom. Um, so its trough point looks like being reached um, certainly this year. Um, I'm not suggesting we're going to see any strong prices growth because the economy is still underperforming. But I, I thought it was interesting that that sort of tests that model theory in reality about that trough point being higher than the previous trough point. It sort of eliminates any sense of it there having been a, a sort of a Perth bubble. But there's no doubt that that trough point in Perth is now starting to flatten out and it's, um, it's considerably higher than the previous trough point, uh, which was in uh, 2000. And 11. So quite an interesting uh, reflection uh, on that particular model. We'll talk about Perth a little bit later on. So a model there, I think it's uh, quite a, a, a positive way of explaining how our markets perform. And if we look at the reality, we can see a similar thing. So if we could go to the next slide, that would be good. So let's have a quick history lesson here of um, our recent capital city prices growth. Just quickly, 2011, we saw prices down. We had higher interest rates there. Um, and of course, that was uh, a part of um, uh, a growing economic environment. The Reserve Bank put up interest rates. Uh, we had a very strong period before that, very strong expansion phase. So correction phase, all prices in capital city markets were down. Uh, 2012, which is the next slide, uh, we saw uh, interest rates start to rise. And, and of course, that saw uh, prices stabilising. Um, uh, and um, affordability had improved, of course, with lower prices from the previous period uh, and lower interest rates. Uh, but the response to those lower rates was uh, generated by um, uh, local factors, the rate of growth. Um, and it was quite interesting, and I think this is instructive um, for um, Melbourne market, particularly this year, coming up on July the 1st, and something else I'll discuss later, um, was that we saw Sydney break clear of the pack. Um, Sydney had a very strong 2012, uh, and the reason the Sydney market, um, uh, I guess, left out of the blocks uh, with those lower rates was that the uh, state government um, uh, announced that it was going to change the stamp duty uh, treatment for first home buyers uh, from uh, new and established to just new. But there was a cutoff period at the end of the year, and what we saw was a rush into market for first home buyers take advantage of the uh, changed conditions until they, uh, and, and, uh, until the end of the year when they would, um, or when they came into force, uh, before they came to force at the end of the year. And what we saw then was actually the, the generation of the Great Sydney boom because those first home buyers, thousands of them, rushed into the marketplace. Um, they bought established properties. It created a ripple effect. And um, really that's where the Sydney um, price growth really generated from. Now, as you all probably know, uh, from July the 1st this year in Melbourne, there will be no stamp duty paid by first home buyers for both established and new properties. So um, I'm expecting um, a uh, similar rush to market from first home buyers in Melbourne in the second half of this year. Of course, it's the state government's um, plan to, you know, to get more first home buyers into the marketplace. It will succeed. 
obviously, if, if they don't get a surge in first home buyers, it would show that there was no underlying demand there in the first place. So, uh, but I believe we will see a surge in first home buyers, and I think that's going to um, accelerate Melbourne's house price growth through the second half of the year. And we will get that same ripple effect because we'll see a lot of those first home buyers, um, you know, buying uh, established properties, and that will activate change over buyers and. I think particularly in that uh, five to six hundred thousand dollar price range, I think buyers will start moving up from there, um, and I think that uh, uh, I think that we'll see a, a strong result in Melbourne this year. Now that's because of those local factors, and that's what I said at the beginning, our beginning slide that I expect most housing markets uh, to moderate their price growth um, this year because of the interest rate environment. But I think Melbourne's an exception. I think Melbourne will continue to grow. There are other factors for the Melbourne market, which we'll, we'll talk about later as well. But that's instructive that what happened in 2012 in the Sydney market. Uh, we may see the same thing occurring in Melbourne this year. So 2013, we had a sharp fall in interest rates. Uh, and of course, we had prices rising right across the board uh, with affordability improving. And of course, confidence is a key there in, um, in our housing market. That come both buyers and sellers. And the buyer's confidence was certainly on the rise then. Again, um, local factors determined um, the rate of growth and, um, you know, particularly smaller markets such as Canberra and Hobart were uh, performing as well as the bigger markets because of um, local economic underperformance. So 2014, we actually had interest rates on hold through the year. Again, you can see the consistency of price uh, movements and the mining boom becoming apparent in, uh, in Darwin um, and strong growth continuing in that Sydney market. Um, but most markets still growing in 2014. 2015, we had interest rates rise early in the year, and then we had APRA acting to taper the market at the end of the year. So it was a very up and down market in terms of strong growth to start with, with lower rates, and then growth moderating at the end of the year when interest rates were increased for investors, and then uh, they were increased for owner occupiers as well at, um, uh, because of new policies from the financial regulator APRA. Um, but Sydney's still a very strong market, um, but we were starting to see clearly the end of the, uh, the mining boom impacting the Perth and the Darwin markets. Last year, 2016, as I mentioned before, um, we started the year off with flatter growth um, because of that, um, of those higher interest rates at the end of 2015. Um, and then we saw interest rate cuts in May and then a follow up in August, and that uh, certainly got the, uh, the market up and running. These are year on year interest rate uh, or price increases. So these aren't December quarter versus December quarter. This is the full year versus the full year. So you can actually see that uh, the full year's median for Sydney in 2015 versus 2016, 2016 was only 4.1% higher uh, because that, that took out the volatility of that lower price outcome at the end of 2015. Uh, and the high prices at the end of 2016. So in reality, the Sydney market prices only grew by 4.1% year on year last year. But Melbourne certainly broke clear of the pack last year uh, with 7.4% year, uh, year on year growth. Um, and um, Melbourne is currently still the strongest growing housing market uh, in the country. And I expect that to remain the same and we'll talk about those reasons. So this year so far, um, we have started to see um, prices growth uh, flatten, um, and, and as I said, it's no surprise because um, the further we get away from interest rates, the less energy we have to push up prices. There's no magic pudding for house price growth. It's either higher or lower interest rates. Short-term changes to tax measures can have an impact, but it's basically an interest rate story, as I said before. Um, and we saw certainly quieter growth from Sydney, 2.8% over the quarter. Um, Brisbane down, but typically starts the year off quite slowly. Brisbane has a very seasonal uh, you know, override to the cycle with a quiet start the year in Brisbane and solid finish. Other markets performing quite well. Uh, Perth down by 1.8%, but that wasn't actually too bad a result given that it actually increased over uh, prices in Perth, increased for the first time in uh, 18 months over the December quarter 16. But we did see those markets, Canberra, Hobart, particularly had been underperformers starting to come back and very strong growth there, but they're coming uh, from uh, a bit of a way back. So uh, next slide, we can see that um, over the past year, uh, when we look at the December quarter versus December quarter rates, uh, which have, as I said, have that volatility involved, still very strong quarter to quarter or December quarter to December quarter results. 
and Melbourne well ahead of the pack with 15.2%. But let's remember uh, that reflects a very low uh, December quarter 2015 and a very high December quarter 2016. So next slide there. Um, so if we remember our model to start with and we look at where our markets are in regard to their last peak of the cycle, um, we can certainly see Sydney's growing clearly ahead of the rest. If we put all these numbers uh, together onto the uh, onto the chart, uh, our original chart, um, we can we can see where our uh, capital city housing markets are uh, are positioned on the next slide. So um, the current cycle, we can certainly see that the uh, the underperformers have, have really just um, uh, moved ahead of the previous peak point. It shows two things. Firstly, there's potential for upside. Um, it hasn't been a crazy story about Melbourne and Sydney moving ahead of the fundamentals. They've, in fact, um, reached their fundamentals. So, in a sense, they've been in fourth gear. First, Canberra, Adelaide and Brisbane and Hobart have really been in second and third gear because of local factors. Uh, and Darwin and Perth clearly into that correction phase, as I said. But there's no doubt that we are now looking at a bottoming out, uh, particularly of the Perth market. Um, I think we're sort of the first ones to call that now anyway. Um, as I said, it doesn't mean that we're going to see any strong growth soon for Perth, uh, but it means that um, you know, we'll start to see buyers moving back into that market in higher numbers uh, because of perceptions of good value opportunities, which certainly there are with prices at three to four year lows. So um, there's some other uh, important insights into the Perth market I'll talk about later. We're starting to see a flattening uh, or certainly improvement in the, um, uh, the rental market there. So our current capital city, uh, the current quarter capital city markets, we can still see that um, you know that price growth has uh, translated into high prices. Sydney well ahead of the rest, a median of 1.15 uh, million and still rising. Not as strong as last year, but still rising. Melbourne 843. I believe the Melbourne median is um, on its way to a million dollar median. Uh, I think that Melbourne is likely um, to reach that million dollar mark maybe around about the middle of next year. Uh, I also think the prospect, you see clearly affordability advantages are, are there in the other capital city markets. Um, Brisbane's half the, the median of Sydney um, and those other markets still. Canberra's grown quite strongly over the past year, but that had a very flat period uh, due to local um, employment issues from the um, fiscal consolidation of the budgets uh, in 2000. And 13 and 14, but that's been turning around recently. The big drivers in Melbourne and, and Sydney are people. We're having record migration into the Melbourne market at the moment, uh, and I mean record migration, and that's what's putting a lot of pressure on the rental market. Uh, and certainly, Sydney's also uh, recording very strong migration. And we're also starting to see, which I think is very interesting, a turnaround in migration into Brisbane. Um, I think that what we're seeing now is those affordability advantages. Uh, retirees, uh, those looking for that northern lifestyle, are now heading back into uh, into Brisbane, to southeast Queensland. Uh, a lot of investors are starting to look uh, again at the Brisbane market. Uh, obviously, with higher yields and uh, a lower entry point, that market is particularly attractive. Uh, but there's no doubt that from a, a, a significant decline in uh, in migration uh, in the, in Queensland um, from the end of the mining boom, and it was a significant decline. Um, in fact. Migration into Queensland got to uh, two decade lows, so the lowest for 20 years. But uh, the trend is now certainly reversing, um, and there's a lot of forward indicators that people are moving back into Brisbane. I expect that to continue, um, and that market to, uh, I'm not saying we're going to have a boom in Brisbane, but I think that market will continue to tick over nicely, as it actually has done over the last three or four years. In fact, given all the, the headwinds that the Brisbane market has faced uh, in terms of the end of the resources boom, the 2011 flood, um, there was a big job shakeout for the previous government. Uh, the Brisbane market has grown consistently over the last four years at around about 5% per year. And I think that's a, a tremendous result given um, the economic uh, and uh, headwinds and, and other uh, issues that that market has faced. I think now, particularly with the prospects of a lower dollar, which we certainly hope for, that the Brisbane market is certainly looking uh, prime to continue with, at least with the growth levels of recent years. Uh, our next slide, of course, we've discussed a lot of the key price drivers for our housing markets, which we need to look at, and that determines what the price growth is. And of course, it does depend on the economy, um, and I will talk about the economy uh, shortly. So unemployment and jobs, of course, uh, we can just quickly look at unemployment and jobs. 
unemployment rate, as I said, came out today. Better news, 5.7%. Um, the real issue with our economy now is not so much the unemployment rate, it's the underemployment rate. Um, we've, we've lost a lot of full-time jobs. In fact, about 150,000 full-time jobs over the last two years have disappeared from the Australian economy. Uh, we are shifting into this part-time workforce. Uh, people aren't getting as much work as they want. Um, and of course, the offset to this new economy we're in, which we shouldn't be surprised at because the rest of the world is in this uh, deflationary stagnant environment, is that wages and incomes and profits are, uh, are, are subdued. In fact, incomes growth is, um, is the lowest on record. And we had our income numbers out from the ABF um, this week and it showed that incomes are up by just 1.9% over the past year. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, below the inflation rate. So in fact, prices are rising faster than incomes. And no surprise that uh, I think the big news that we got out, out of budget week wasn't so much the budget, it was the fact that retail sales in Australia fell for the second month in a row. So retail sales were down in, uh, in March, and they're also down in February. Now, that's the last, that's the first time since 2012 that we've had consecutive falls in retail sales. And this must be a real concern for the Reserve Bank because it was consumer spending and consumption that was uh, supposed to be the next driving force for our economy after construction. Well, of course, with low incomes growth, low wages, people are not inclined to spend. Uh, and, and the big growth markets in terms of prices, as we've seen, have been particularly Sydney and to uh, a, a lesser degree, the Melbourne uh, the Melbourne market. So again, they're important for the future direction of interest rates we've discussed. Tax policies we've looked at, um, you know, uh, the last thing you want to be doing is trying to, you know, uh, increase demand in areas where there's fixed supply. Now, any any um, measures, reducing stamp duty, uh, giving first home buyer grants, anything that's designed to increase demand um, in a in a, where there's already demand is ahead of supply will only mean higher prices. Unfortunately, a lot of our policy outcomes now are being sort of playing to the mob, highly political um, uh, solutions to, as I said, problems that the market usually um, sort of, uh, fixes over time. So stock market is important too, and that's really gone nowhere since the GFC, our stock market. Population growth, as I said, is a critical point for our housing markets. Uh, we're starting to see, as I said, uh, Signs of a rebound into Brisbane, that will help. Uh, we've seen uh, people, the, the lowest number in decades of net migration into Western Australia, of course, that's impacted its uh, market. Similarly, lower numbers in uh, in Darwin, but um, there's no doubt the population increases in Canberra, Hobart, um, uh, Melbourne and Sydney are driving house price growth and, and continuing to do so. Of course, new home supply, um, it's interesting. We, we've, we're actually, we've actually passed the peak of our, uh, our approval cycle, um, and that's concerning as well because a lot of our growth has come from construction, uh, housing construction. That's always the plan with lower interest rates, create demand, create um, the capacity for new, with more demand, uh, more demand for new houses means more jobs. Um, and even though we've got more product to come through into our markets, both Sydney and Brisbane and the other smaller capitals, um, the approval cycle has fallen away quite sharply. In fact, in Brisbane, the approvals have, have almost collapsed for new product coming through. So when the existing stock is uh, is moved uh, into buyers, um, there's not going to be a lot following on. I think those high yields in Brisbane um, reflect that that's a good value market at the moment and those uh, yields will only fall. And confidence, of course, is uh, another key aspect to our housing market. In fact, that cycle uh, model I showed you is basically confidence cycle as well. Obviously, confidence is low, the top point of the market, confidence is high at the peak point of the market and that's the key to the first market once we see a bottoming of that market we'll see confidence starting to return gradually um, to the housing market okay next one interest rates we've discussed you can see here quite clearly the relationship between uh, interest rate movements and um, this is the real cycle by the way um, and you can see the correlation there between um, um, uh, each capital city market, and you can see as interest rates fall, prices rise, interest rates rise, uh, prices fall. That's the bank, the red the red, um, uh, the red, line there is the bank uh, interest rates. You can see a little bit of a divergence there from official rates, from bank mortgage rates. In fact, if you look at the red line where it's not dotted, that was at the end of 2015. Uh, that's when banks uh, conducted that out of cycle increase in rates. 
And you can see, uh, because the Sydney market uh, on the scale is more pronounced, you can see the dip in the Sydney market with those higher interest rates at the end of 2015. Um, and as I said, this is a clear uh, reflection of, of where we will go or the impact that higher interest rates enable from APRA uh, will have on our housing markets. And that's another factor uh, that's pushing towards flatter prices growth um, this year, those higher rates uh, as, a, as a result of APRA actions. So next, um, our next uh, slide. Of course, you know, as we always see, as the prices grow in housing markets, that's another uh, another part of our, our dynamic. We see investor activity increasing. This is the national investor market. We saw it rising sharply as prices rose um, in 2015. Then we saw a dip with those higher interest rates from APRA, but we have seen a revival now in investor activity, um, and that's why APRA has acted again. Of course, they're seeing the investor activity rising. Uh, and uh, as I said, quite uh, confoundingly, they believe that this is at some level a risk to the banking sector. Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I mean, this is a real issue for me for a number of reasons. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll sort of discuss the reasons here for these actions. Um, and if we look at uh, the whole share of uh, investor lending in the whole of Australia, we can see that um, nearly 50% of lending is coming out of New South Wales. So. Uh, we have interest rates rising across the board for investors, and yet most of the lending is coming out of New South Wales. I'm not sure the uh, the Perth um, uh, investors and uh, property owners or prospective investors are, are happy about having to pay higher interest rates for a market that needs some stimulus based on what is clearly uh, a very Sydney-centric investor model. Um, and you can see those levels of investment nationally uh, are quite rational compared to uh, the New South Wales market, where clearly most of the investor activity is happening, and that's clearly one of the reasons why that Sydney price growth is left ahead of um, uh, of other capitals of the other capitals. So if we go to the next slide. We can see that um, in terms of the local market share, this shows again Sydney's very much uh, an investor market on New South Wales. And New South Wales accounts for uh, uh, investor lending in New South Wales accounts for 60%, nearly 60% of all residential lending in New South Wales. So six out of 10 loans uh, for housing in New South Wales are going to investors. And you can see even though Victoria is now starting to rise, uh, most of the others are, are around about um, uh, their, their long-term average. So again, policy decisions based on, which, which affect everybody, but in reality, it's very much a, a Sydney-centric investor market at the moment. Of course, as I said, that's why we have higher prices in Sydney. I believe over time, however, that economic circumstances will mean we'll get more appetite for residential investment. We have this low growth, low uh, interest rate, um, low income economy. Um, I think that that's going to work its way into a uh, higher appetite for residential lending, uh, notwithstanding those higher interest rates from APRA, which I think will, um, uh, I guess, in the, in the clear light of day going forward, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, will seem to be counterproductive um, rather than uh, you know, risk managing a, a, a problem that really doesn't exist in terms of the bank's overexposure to investors. So tax enhanced capital growth and investment returns um, are, prov are provided by residential investment. Uh, we have relatively high yields in a low yield economy. You to understand that at the moment, um, we've got uh, in most capital city markets, a, uh, a record gap between what underlying yield is, that is return on bank deposits, uh, and residential yield. I mean, everyone's bemoaning, or you know, the commentator, commentators bemoan low yields, three, four, five percent yields, but they're at record levels against where bank rates are at the moment. And more and more, we're seeing investors chasing yield um, you know, as well as capital growth. And, and that's the flight to yield and residential investment in this type of a, an economy will continue. Uh, will continue. So, uh, and of course, there is that underlying connection to bricks and mortar investment that most Australians have. Um, you know, it's a preferential component in, in a mixed financial portfolio. Um, the options, like such as the stock market, are certainly are underperforming and volatile. We've seen changes to superannuation, which are making. Um, and some changes promoted by the, the Labor government or the prospective Labor government, the Labor opposition, um, in terms of not allowing self-managed super funds to 
invest in residential property, which are which are quite again confounding. Um, you know, given that there's plenty of appetite uh, for, from superannuation, stock managed super funds to borrow uh, or to purchase um, residential property, and there's really no risk there because it's a quite a tight lending environment. Um, and of course, the big picture is really in terms of capital growth going forward that all our housing markets remain chronically undersupplied over the medium term. Uh, we're seeing tight vacancy rates. Vacancy rates are tightening everywhere. Even the Perth market is now starting to see its tight, its vacancy rates tighten. Um, I was surprised that when we ran the Melbourne vacancy rates for um, for March, that the unit vacancy rates dipped sharply under two percent. I thought there might have been a, a some issue with the modelling. Um, I checked it out; it was okay. And then I looked at the April uh, vacancy rate data, and, and it validated it was even lower. So again, um, the Melbourne market, the Sydney market. Um, are clearly running out of rental properties, and and we've had some uh, quite but disturbing increases in rents. Uh, Melbourne rents and Sydney rents up five percent over the past year. Uh, vacancy rates are now below two percent in um, in Melbourne uh, in Sydney for both houses and units, and in Melbourne they're well well below two percent for houses and units. And the prospect for higher uh, rents is certainly continuing, uh, particularly given that we're we're losing rental stock. Uh, through a couple of factors. Firstly, a lot of our new apartments are remaining empty. Uh, the government are acting to try to, uh, um, you know, try to enforce properties to uh, be occupied. Good luck with that. I'm not sure that'll work at all. Um, and the other point is we're also seeing Airbnb suck out um, permanent rentals from uh, um, you know, in holiday and business rentals. And uh, that means that our rental markets will continue to be chronically undersupplied means higher rents, and those, uh, that, that means obviously steady rental returns uh, into the future uh, because you know, the rental market is clearly undersupplied. So first home buyers, of course, are the victims of, um, uh, of higher prices typically, you know, and um, we really are seeing, and this is driving, of course, demand for tenancies. New South Wales has the lowest level of first home buyer activity in its history. There's nothing that's going to fix this uh, except more houses. That's the clear, um, the only clear solution to bringing first home buyers back into the market. It's not to give them handouts, uh, it's to provide more housing. And, and if anything, the government's acting to roadblock supply, uh, particularly from um, from investors. And uh, as I said, it's quite confounding, but um, you know, the, the New South Wales Sydney market is, is really heading towards being an investor market permanently um, because of the, the roadblocks that uh, um, uh, to, uh, to first home buyers. The economy, we've sort of discussed the economy uh, broadly, um, but this is uh, last month's unemployment rates. This is part of the issue, which I think is still there, even though we've got a better result today. Um, unemployment rates are higher. Um, this is the March data, we'll get the April data out next week, but unemployment rates are higher or the same in every capital city market uh, March this year compared to March last year. Sydney's still clearly the strongest capital city market, very strong economy, the Sydney economy of the major economies. Um, the Melbourne and um, Brisbane markets, Brisbane's picked up a bit, that's a volatile market but needs watching, but that Melbourne uh, unemployment rate is reflecting very strong demand um, jobs from uh, surging migration. And of course, the Perth market still has its challenges with that very high unemployment rate. But at the end of the day, these numbers, I believe, have to improve or it's a no-brainer for uh, uh, another uh, key driver of lower interest rates uh, from the Reserve Bank. Uh, next slide, thank you. And of course, we're seeing the correlation of that with um, actual jobs growth um, uh, declining. And we can see that in um, uh, in the resource markets are still struggling. But the interesting thing is Melbourne there, despite higher unemployment, jobs are growing. And that's a clear sign that um, of surging population, surging migration into Melbourne, and, and that's a key driver of uh, uh, of um, housing market activity. So briefly, the economic outlook going forward, just finishing up now. Um, our economy does remain stagnant, real second gear economy. Um, as I said, the future certainly still cloudy. Jobless rate is mixed, chronic low inflation, wages and growth. Uh, Reserve Bank remains positive in the economy, but I think that rate cuts are still possible. Inflation, jobless are the key, uh, but they'd be very worried about those retail sales figures. And I think we're going to get a, uh, the March quarter, I believe, will be will, will be very close, but 
Uh, it may be negative growth again over the March quarter. We had negative growth over the September quarter. The economy bounced back uh, from a very good trade result over the December quarter. That saved us from a recession. But I believe, given also the damage to the lower retail sales and also um, the uh, impact of the cyclone in northern Queensland, I think that we'll see uh, negative growth over the March quarter. So uh, th this isn't a good, these aren't the sort of conditions where you want to even be thinking about higher rates. And I think that given the prospect of higher rates from the banks, whether it be from the tax or from the regulator, means that the Reserve Bank will have to offset that. And that'll keep some balance in housing markets in terms of where interest rates go. Um, and of course, we have a high budget deficit, so we can't, as in recent periods, spend our way out of trouble. We still have to rely on interest rates. Um, finance growth is, is improving, but it still doesn't have the previous force it had with us. Our US economy is still fragile. It's in the same boat as us. Unemployment numbers look OK, but underemployment is a real problem there. Uh, wages growth is very low, and um, you know they're seeing political consequences to what are very unhappy people since the GFC. Our local currency is still too high. We need to get rates down, of course, again, and make our dollar get under 70 cents. That's the best news we could have. And we can't just rely on US rate rises um, to push our dollar down. Uh, stock market is still very volatile. So our capital city, um, uh, certainly New South Wales, has the best prospects. It's a very solid, uh, even performer. Uh, Victoria is, um, um, has built itself on uh, construction and services since the manufacturing base. Wind. And I think we're going to get a second wind in construction in Victoria soon, uh, with that strong demand coming through. Uh, Queensland is looking for a lower dollar. Uh, it's a strong exporter and a low value state, so lower dollar always helps it. Um, and, and migration has fallen but for now, but I think that we're starting to see that reversing. The South Australia still has a journey, but it's a remarkably resilient housing market, South Australian market. Uh, Western Australia, of course, is in transition and it'll be a journey back to solid growth in that market, but we are starting to see um, some uh, bottoming out, signs of bottoming out in both the uh, uh, price and rental market. Uh, Tasmania is certainly improving, um, and uh, the ACT has had a very strong previous year, and the Northern Territory, small economy, but strong economy, um, but the lower population is still impacting that market, but we are also similar to Perth, so to see a, uh, a decline in vacancy rates there. Next slide. <laughs> Sorry. Next slide. Yeah, we good. So just quickly, this is my predictions for the year going forward. Um, I think that um, we will see the uh, uh, we will see the Perth and Darwin markets uh, find their bottom this year. Uh, maybe some slight growth. Brisbane, another solid five percent, and I think the the risks are, are higher there. Sydney, Hobart, and Canberra around about seven percent. That might be a little bit higher than the, the actual outcome, but I do believe that the um, Melbourne market is looking for 10% this year, particularly given, and I've changed these because of the change to the tax mix for uh, first home buyers in Melbourne. And um, so I think that'll be around about where we are uh, this year in terms of the mark. Uh, Brisbane maybe a little higher, uh, Sydney, uh, Hobart and Canberra, maybe just a touch lower, but I think that'll be basically where we're sitting, but I'm pretty confident about that Melbourne market, certainly around the 10% mark this year. So uh, just finishing up now, this is our final slide. Um, this is the national policy conundrum, monetary and fiscal, that, as I've discussed, these ad hoc one size fits all policies that tend to exacerbate or create market imbalances and stress rather than solve problems. Monetary policy is, certainly seems to be set for that hot Sydney and Melbourne market, but rates are still way too high for the resource states. And I think the Reserve Bank's got to start to recognise that. It's, um, it's fixation with offsetting a, a supposed asset bubble, which we have, as I said, no historical evidence for, or we don't certainly have the economic preconditions for a sharp increase in interest rates. And, and the apartment glut risk, so-called, is now proving to be also um, uh, just, you know, uh, 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 something that's not uh, uh, reflecting the actual outcomes at the moment. Um, as I said, rents are, are rising. We're seeing prices in Melbourne apartments rising, Sydney apartments rising, and um, I think we'll see... Uh, uh, prices start to stabilise and rise in that Brisbane market uh, within the next 12 months for apartments in the city of Brisbane market. So uh, higher relative rates keep our dollar too high for exporters. The national economy continues to underperform as we've discussed. We need more stimulus. Higher jobless, lower jobs growth, fat wages growth, underemployment, falling retail sales and subdued business investment. 
Um, I think the latest policy initiatives have missed implications for Brisbane and other markets. Um, it's quite, as I said, I think that was a political document for um, a political document uh, to sort of offset what's been, you know, a very strong debate regarding housing affordability this year. I think a lot of the measures were, um, you know, won't have a real significant impact on the market going forward, but they did tend, tend to answer what have been a lot of questions about uh, housing market activity. This incentive for foreign buyers and developers and interstate investors are quite counterintuitive where we need more rather than less. Um, the first home buyer saving initiative through super fund, through super um, accounts and those downsizer incentives are a clear positive. I think a big move in the apartment market particularly will be from downsizers looking for a couple larger in the city apartments. I think um, developers are now gearing up to start to provide rather than small one bedroom and studio apartments, they're now looking to uh, take advantage of a surge in downsizer activity um, uh, and their uh, floor plates are changed to all their floor plans are changed to two or three uh, bedroom outcomes. The bank tax will likely be passed on through higher rates. So I don't even think there's a question mark that needs to be there. Upper initiatives, uh, as we've said, are designed to quell investor activity in Sydney market, but what about the rest? Uh, the budget thing, of course, was when we looked at the forecasts for jobless growth and the dollar, they were they were downgraded from the mid-year review over December. So uh, the mid-year budget review in December was obviously optimistic, and uh, since then they've been downgraded. As I said, our Australian economy is stuck in second gear, and, and just like the rest of the world, and that's the point now, we've moved out of the resources boom and we've joined the rest of the world in terms of this, uh, what I believe will be a long-term a stagnant economic um, environment. And now, don't get me wrong, I'm not negative about the prospects for the Australian economy. I think that they're as good as anywhere, um, but we just can't expect that roller coaster boom and bust scenario, strong growth, higher interest rates that we've had over the last two or three decades. We're in for a much flatter, but still positive uh, outcome. But um, I think we've got to get policymakers um, singing off the same uh, songbook here to make sure that we get that outcome. Uh, so as I said, I think there'll be, unless there's an improvement in those economic conditions, and I don't think there will be, the bank will have to cut rates regardless of those Sydney and Melbourne housing markets and to offset higher rates from those um, sort of rebel banks. But um, as I said, I've been concerned that, um, you know, a, a lot of the narrative in terms of official interest rate spending seems to be focused on housing market activity. And at the end of the day, really, it's only that Sydney market that's got any semblance uh, of having uh, moved beyond its um, uh, fundamentals. But in fact, I, uh, I'm releasing tomorrow uh, the latest affordability index for the Sydney market, um, which looks at the proportion of the average or the average loan repayment in terms of the average wage, uh, the average household income. It actually shows that the affordability index uh, has fallen um, over the March quarter uh, and it's now below 90 uh, and 100 being the average over the last uh, the last two decades. So um, there's really no signs on any other measures, rational measures of affordability uh, problems in that Sydney market and, and that it tends to be the focus of a lot of the narrative in terms of um, you know, overheating housing markets and the need you know, not to cut interest rates to uh, you know, create even more energy there. So, uh, I think that's it. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. I think you. we've sort of have gone way over time. <laughs> No, no, that's okay. I, um, I've, I've had our friends from um, Adelaide uh, typing in a question just relating to this slide. Um, yep. Where, where, oh, do, they, where, do, they, where do they sit on this slide? <laughs> oh, my God. Apologies for that. No, I think the Adelaide one fits in quite nicely with Brisbane. Apologies for that one. Go on, help me. I think I've guess my first blooper for a long time. But, yes, no, Adelaide will remain around about that uh, 5% mark. The only difference from Adelaide, and I think that's a very good result, anyway because of the um, nature of the local economy as we saw that economic data in some of the previous slides the Adelaide unemployment rate remains at around seven percent but um, I'm always a very a very positive about the Adelaide market because I think the confidence there as we know rises and falls with the cycle it's one market that's perhaps a little counter to that confidence cycle and it just keeps on sort of keeping on in fact uh, there's some very good opportunities there for, uh, I, I believe, with those high-yielding investors, investments to the north of the city. But look, unemployment is still a problem in, in the Adelaide market. But I'm uh, pretty confident that that'll grow similar to Brisbane by around about 5% this year. So apologies for that, everybody in Adelaide. <laughs> you do exist. I was there three weeks ago. Oh, well. Look out next time you arrive in the report. Yeah, that's all good, mate. Okay. 
Excellent. Well, thank you um, very much, Andrew, and um, thanks everybody um, for, um, for for joining. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to do a Q and A session. I know it's just it's just come up um, just over the hour. So for those people that do need to head off, um, uh, I just want to uh, mention again to thank Andrew um, for for um, insights and information, and also to thank Terry Shear. And uh, as I mentioned, if uh, if you already own uh, investment property and you don't have uh, landlord's insurance, I, I would strongly suggest that you go and find out a bit more um, at the Terry Share website, which you can see on the screen there. And certainly if you're looking at buying um, your next investment property, which I know a number of you will be, uh, one of the things you need to make sure that you do um, before you settle is, uh, is to get your landlord's insurance in place, which Terry Share can help you with. So thanks very much to them and, and, and jump along to the, uh, to the Terry Share website that you can see on the screen there to find out more. Okay, and, uh, and as I mentioned at the top of the session, um, from a Terry Share perspective as well, with, uh, with all the info that we've provided, to, provided tonight, it's, uh, it's obviously of a general nature and um, make sure you do your own inquiries uh, before um, proceeding with anything.